Welcome to part two of the Algebra 2 SOL practice items. Let's again review some best practices. First, remember to think concept, not algorithm. Why am I doing the problem this way? What is this problem actually asking me to do? When in doubt, write it out. When you can see the work on the paper, you can find your mistakes more easily and see what to do next more easily. Let the calculator be your helper, but not your guide. Remember that the, uh, the calculator relies on you, the operator, to put in the right information. It doesn't just do the math for you. Finally, in the end, do your best. You'll regret anything less than that. Continuing where we left off, we have another system of equations. The directions here say to select all the correct answers. It doesn't tell me how many there are and it asks to identify the x-coordinate for each point that is in the solution set of this system of equations. So again, remember what a system is. It means that there are two graphs on the same coordinate plane, and we're looking for the places where they intersect. And specifically this time, we're looking for the x-coordinates for that. Remember that there's definitely more than one way to solve a system of equations. Since you have a graphing calculator, graphing is never a bad idea. You would need to take this first equation here and solve it for y. So in order to do that, I'm actually going to start off with a little bit of a different method than you might normally use in class. I'm going to add 4y to each side. Once I've done that, I can use my symmetric property and flip it around and put the 4y on the left. It's going to keep me from making a bunch of sign mistakes. Then to finish it off, I'm going to divide by 4. Remember that that makes fractions here, which you can easily input on your graphing calculator. So I can graph y equals 5 fourths x minus 11 fourths and y equals x squared minus x minus 6 and see where the two graphs intersect. Here's an example from a graphing calculator screen of what that looks like right here. The parabola, that's the second of the two, that's the quadratic equation here. And then the line, that's the first one. And here's what it looks like when I typed them in. Notice that at this point, I am looking for the x coordinates of the solutions to this system. So I am looking for the x coordinates for these two points right here. Well, this one is pretty clearly negative one. And this one, well, looks like it's a little bit bigger than three. So it's three point something. And now I can see on my answer choices that I do indeed have a negative one and a three point something. Remember that you don't know how many are correct. But sometimes with these questions, they'll tell you that you've already selected enough answers and you have to unselect one. That can be a little surprising when you haven't seen it before. This question asks, which graph could represent a function g of x, that's the log of x plus c, where the value of c is less than zero? So the first concept we're looking at here is the shape of some parent function. And there are quite a few parent functions that we learn about. In this case, we're looking at the shape of a logarithmic function. And then we're looking at what happens when you add a constant to that. And then more specifically, when that constant is negative. So we're looking at making a transformation of a logarithmic function. That means we're going to move it. There's the basic form of a logarithmic function, and then there's the different ways you can move it around the graph. So this image here is y equals the, nat uh, the uh, log base 10 of x. When you don't see a number next to it, that's a log base 10. What does that mean, log base? Well, let's just very quickly review. Log base a of b, um, let's say that equals x. Well, the way I can rewrite that is I can say the base a to the, to the x power over here has to equal b. So in my function down at the bottom of the screen here on the calculator, this is basically saying 10 to the y power equals x. That's what the ordered pairs fit here. And you can see the shape. Now the next thing that happens on our graph is that they want us to add a constant c and that that c is negative. 
Well, that's going to cause what we call a vertical transformation. This C is outside the function, so it's affecting the value of Y. That means that it's going to move it either up or down. And if C is negative, then to be more specific, it's going to move it down. So which one would give me a graph that looks like the one on my screenshot, but move down? Graph D. On this question, it asks which function is best represented by the graph that you see here. So the first concept here is that we have what's called a rational function. Again, rational is um, fractions, and you can see that each of my answer choices has a fraction in it, an algebraic fraction, a fraction that has variables in it. So now we need to know some things about those functions. We need to know that there are asymptotes on those functions. Careful saying that word, asymptotes. Those are imaginary boundary lines that the function will never, ever touch. So it's values that either x can never equal or y can never equal. Based on the asymptotes and based on the way the functions are written, that's how we're going to identify this one as the graph we see in front of us. Obviously, you can use your graphing calculator to help you with this, but remember, we should always be thinking about concept first. Now, I know that the asymptotes here are x equals positive 3. Sorry, it's a little messy. It's a little hard to write with a stylus and these little narrow lines. And y equals 0. Since I know that those are the asymptotes, I know that x cannot equal 3 and that y will not equal 0. And since I also know that if x was equal to 3 in these denominators right here, that that would give me an undefined value. And that's what causes that asymptote. So one of those two has to be my answer, and it's not a or c. So at this point, a good strategy is for me to take my graphing calculator and figure out which of these two answers is the one that matches what I see here. Which one is the one that will give me an asymptote of a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. So here is the graph, a screenshot of the graph, when I put b into my graphing calculator. So that is our correct answer here. And in order to type that in the way that we see it on the screen with that horizontal fraction bar, I just wanted to quickly review that you use alpha y equals. Alpha y equals is what gives you that chance to make the numerator over denominator with the horizontal fraction bar. Select all the correct answers. The graph of the parent function is shown. Identify each function which belongs to this same family. So again, we're talking about parent functions. So when they say a parent function, they're talking about the, like the template function, what the basic version with no bells and whistles looks like with no transformations, no stretches or shrinks that makes it taller or shorter or stretches it out wider from left to right, no vertical or horizontal translations that slides the function around and makes it look different. So this is the parent function. Which of these four have the same shape, do the same thing? Well, if I go through and graph them, here you have from left to right, top to bottom, which ones have the same basic shape? Well, this first one does. It's just that it's flipped upside down. And remember, that's called a reflection. In this case, a reflection over the y-axis. So that one definitely matches. The second one, well, this one does not. This one has the two parts of the graph in opposite quadrants. And that is great, but that is not going to reflect uh, that doesn't have the same shape, I should say, as what you see over here. Now look at the difference in the function. This one was 3 over x. Well, this one was 3 over x squared. Huh. Well, maybe that's part of what gives us our answer. Let's think about, as that, we move, think about that as we move forward. This third one, shaped exactly like this one, but it's shifted to the left. So yes, that one works. That is the same parent function. And again, we have... One where, oh, it's in two different parts, two different quadrants, really. So it's shaped like this one. And notice again, no squared on the bottom. They didn't square the denominator. So that one, also not correct. So I have a feeling it's the squaring of that denominator that gives this its specific shape, which means that our parent function here is probably 
probably y equals 1 over x squared. So you could even check that on your graphing calculator. On this one, it says the directions are to select all the correct answers. Again, it does not tell us how many. Remember, sometimes it will, but most of the time it won't. Identify each function with the same range as f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 4. So this is a function. So we're the main issue here with the concept we're looking at is functions. We're talking about the range of the function. So it's important that I stop and I remember, oh, I know that. The range, that's the y values. So that's what the function looks like vertically. So maybe the best thing to do here would be to start with, well, what's the range of the function they gave me? Well, the function they gave me is right here. It's f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 4. So it's the v-shaped graph, but down 4. Okay. Here are all my answer choices written out, uh, drawn out on the same graph, plus the absolute value one that we already have. So what I'm looking for is I am looking for all the graphs that have the same y values as this one, and that's from negative 4 and up. So let's go one at a time. This red one right here, this parabola, no, that's this first one, and that does indeed go all the way down to negative 4, and it has values above that. That is the same as the range of our original function, so that is one of my answers. All right, let's look at the next one. The next one is x cubed minus 4. That's this guy. That definitely does not have the same range because you can see that there are values below negative 4. So that's not a good one. So that's a no. Next one is 2 to the x minus 5. 2 to the x minus 5, that's this pink guy right here. It's down too low. It's got a negative 5 value on it. So nope, that's not it. Square root of x minus 4. That's this green one that starts here at negative 4 and goes up. That has the same range because it goes from negative 4 and up. So that's a good answer. And then this last one is the parabola that's off kilter here, which is gold in color, kind of yellow gold. And that one only has a range of y is greater than or equal to 0. So it's only 0 and up. So that definitely does not match. So your two answers are the first one, x squared plus 2x minus 3, and this fourth one, square root of x minus 4. On this one it says the graph of a function is shown on the coordinate plane, and it wants to know the domain of the function. So again, we're dealing with functions. We're dealing with domain. This time we're dealing with a very strange looking function that's called a piecewise function. And finally, we're looking to find which of these inequalities represents the domain of our function. Notice they all use x, so they're not confusing us between x and y. Domain is definitely x. So based on this graph, what's the correct answer here? So on this particular function, what are the x values? So the domain values, well, the lowest one here is a negative 5. And it continues on up here. Got the open circle at 1, but there's a value for 1 here at, uh, or at negative 1, 1. And then an open circle again underneath it. And then it goes all the way up here to and including 2. So the lowest it goes is negative 5, and the highest it goes is 2. And x is in between there. And it is actually equal to either of those. So b is our correct answer for this question. So here's a TEI question where it says type your answer in the box. Use the forward slash, this guy right here, this forward slash for the fraction bar. So that kind of indicates to us that this is probably going to be a, a fraction. Like not even probably. It's a fraction. Just accept it. It's a fraction. So what are we being asked to do? So here we're being asked to find a zero. So we need to understand what that means. What's a zero of a function? Well, well. That's where y would equal 0 on the coordinate plane, or where, in this case, because it's g of x, where g of x would equal 0. So it's really, when you say a 0, it's really an x-intercept. So it's where y would equal 0. And so that's what we have to do on this problem. 
is figure that out. So I know you're probably thinking, well, then, you know, if it's a zero on a graph, then I'm just going to graph it. But this one is not going to be as easy to do that way because we don't actually, um, uh, you know, it, it's harder to see that on a graph. And, and, and you don't know exactly what that fraction is. And you can't type in a decimal because it says you have to use the fraction bar. So we're going to do this the old fashioned way by writing it out. So if we want a zero, we want where g of x is equal to zero. So we have 0 equals 9 to the x minus 243. So in order to solve this, I'm going to add 243 to each side. And that's going to give me 243 equals 9 to the x power, or because I'd really rather just see it that way, 9 to the x power equals 243. And now I'm going to figure out, you know, with these problems, generally I'm going to be able to rewrite it with a base that's the same on each side. So nine is three squared, which means nine to the x is three to the two x. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the number 243. I'm gonna break it down. If I divide it by three, I'm gonna get 81, which is also divisible by three, and I'm gonna get 27, which is also divisible by three, and I'm gonna get nine, which is also divisible by three, and it's gonna leave me three, which means that 243 is three to the one, two, three, four, fifth power. Three to the fifth power. Well, now I can go ahead and I can solve this equation. If three to the two x is equal to three to the fifth power, then two x must equal five, because if those values are the same, the exponents must be the same. And I can solve it by dividing, and x is five halves. So I can type into my answer box, five forward slash two. Okay, this one says the graph of g of x equals x plus 1 on the top and x on the bottom is, or has, excuse me, and then it gives us some options. It's looking at x-intercepts and y-intercepts. So this one's asking me to view the graph to tell whether we can see the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts and then define what we see. So the concept here is, first of all, what's an intercept? So we definitely have to make sure that we know um, how to find an intercept and what an intercept is. Remember that an x-intercept is where y equals 0 and a y-intercept is where x equals 0. So we're getting to the point where I should start recognizing the shape of this graph. So when we have a fraction that has variables in it, we often will get a graph that's shaped this way, where opposite quadrants, kind of almost completely opposite quadrants, have the two parts of the graph. So I want to be looking at the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts here, and I can already tell that there's an x-intercept right there at negative 1. So there's definitely one x-intercept. And I can tell because the way this graph is shaped, this is not going to suddenly take a U-turn and go south, and neither is this one. So at this point, I know that's the one place where it's going to cross the x-axis. But I'm also noticing that it looks like x equals 0 is an asymptote for this graph which should make sense because x can't equal 0. If x were equal to 0, we'd have a 0 in the denominator. That's what causes, that's what creates these asymptotes on the graph. If x can't equal 0, then there can't be a y-intercept. And that means that the correct answer must be C, one x-intercept and no y-intercept. For this question, it's another TEI, it says select all the correct answers. Once again, remember, it may not tell you how many and it may not stop you if you select too many or not enough. Indicate the intervals where the graph of f of x equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x plus 20 is only increasing throughout the interval. So this is a polynomial function and that's the first, first concept we're looking at here. We're also looking at what does it mean for a function to be increasing or decreasing? Well, to be increasing, we're talking about it basically as going upwards. Always think from left to right, just the way you read the English language, and think increasing, that's going up from left to right. And then decreasing, well, that would be going down from left to right. It's not always going to look quite the same. We're talking about a polynomial function, so it's going to have twists and turns, and it's going to be curvy. 
But this is basically what I'm looking at here. So I went ahead and graphed my function. And what I'm seeing, let's write in a different color from the function, we'll write in red, is that it definitely is going uphill in this first section. Now we can say that that's going uphill from negative infinity up until some point. And I should be able to figure out where that point is. Okay, it looks to me like it's probably negative one. So you might want to zoom out on your graphing calculator so you can see that. So I believe it looks like we're going to be increasing from negative infinity up till negative one. And then it looks like it's going to do something like this. And then it's, oh, look at that, it's decreasing. And it's decreasing from negative one up until it looks like a value of two. Okay, so that's not part of my answer because that's decreasing and we want increasing. And then look here, oh, uphill again. So it's increasing again from two up to positive infinity. So I know that seems like a big jump, but just remember if it keeps going to the right like that, up and up and up, it's not gonna suddenly turn back around. I know that because if this is a cubic graph right here, cubic, then it, this is the shape of the graph. It's gonna have two turning points and three sections. One, two, three sections, one turning point, another turning point. So the answer I'm looking for here has to be from infinity to negative one, and then from two to positive infinity. And those are the sections where the graph of this function is increasing. Again, this is a question about intervals and either increasing or decreasing. Once again, it's increasing. So again, we're talking about a polynomial. We're talking about whether it's going uphill or downhill from left to right. And in this case, they want uphill and which interval, meaning which inequality values of low and high end of x. Once again, having graphed it on the calculator, I just have to take my answer choices and figure out which one isn't going to work. Well, the first answer choice is negative 2 to 0, and I believe that would be from negative 2 here to 0. I'm not sure, you, well, you really can't say either there. It's not just increasing, it's actually increasing and decreasing there. So that's not my answer. So it's not A. From negative infinity to negative one. Well, that one looks like a pretty good shot here. So from negative infinity up to negative one, it is indeed e increasing, that's probably my answer. From negative one over to two, that's decreasing. That's definitely not my answer. From negative infinity, negative 20 to infinity, well, you might think that from negative 20 to infinity, it is kind of increasing because it generally goes uphill, but there's this, this region in the middle where this function is going downhill and that's decreasing. So our correct answer on this one, that's B. For this question, it says to drag each selected equation to the right box. And they want us to identify the equation of the horizontal asymptote and the equation of the vertical asymptote of the function you're given. So the first thing I have to recognize is, again, I have a rational function, which again involves having a fraction. Rational functions generally have asymptotes. Horizontal ones, those are the horizontal lines where it won't cross, and then vertical ones, the vertical lines where it won't cross. And there's a couple things we want to try to remember about horizontal and vertical lines. Horizontal lines are always y equals lines, y equals equations and they have a zero slope, like it's flat, like it's zero effort to go across that if you were like cross country skiing. Vertical lines have an x equals equation, x equals some number, and they are vertical, they have an undefined slope. As in, if you remember slope dude from algebra one, what you would be if you tried to ski a vertical slope, which would be undefined or like dead. So which one is the horizontal asymptote and which one's the vertical? As long as I know what the equations for horizontal and vertical lines look like, I can find my answer using my graphing calculator. Here you see the screenshot for it. Well, if I look at the vertical line here, it looks like the vertical line for our asymptote is somewhere in this region, which means that that's an x equals line, and I'm looking at v's three, and that clearly is x equals three. It can't be x equals 1 fourth, because x equals 1 fourth would be all the way over here, and that definitely is not an asymptote for this function. For my horizontal line, 
switch colors. That definitely looks like it's somewhere in this region. Well, that would be the y equals. So coming over here to look, that's got to be y equals 4 right here. And as long as I put the horizontal asymptote in the correct box and the vertical one in the correct box, I've got my answer. You made it all the way to the end of part two. Part three is coming up next. Thanks for watching.